And today we have fantastic speakers that all of them know a ton about replication, how to do this with various types of data and um, situations. And they also have um, worked on great initiatives related to this topic. So um, I'm very excited to kick off this round table just for the organizational purposes, which is Bernd will introduce the speakers to you in the beginning. And then we start off with some more general questions and then we go along with a discussion among the panelists and um, for about an hour and then we open up the floor and please post all your questions as they pop up in the chat um, and I will then ask them or Beth will ask them to the speakers. Okay, yeah, then I give the floor to Bert. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you our three speakers, Vera, Uri, and Sebastian. Let me start with uh, Vera Tröger. Vera is a professor of our comparative political science at the University of Hamburg. And we are especially grateful to have her on board of this panel for three reasons. First, she was and is specifically interested in political methodology, having published widely on social science methods. And my favorite among her publications is a recent article on to P or not to P, the usefulness of P values in the Swiss Political Science Review. Second, she's also an expert when it comes to teaching and distributing methodological knowledge. She has previously been a professor of quantitative political economy at Warwick University and a director of the Essex Summer School in Social Science Data Analysis. And finally, as the former editor-in-chief of the methods-driven journal Political Science Research and Methods, PSRM, and as the current editor-in-chief of the Journal of Politics, one of the most well-known journals in political science, she, in my view, not only has the expertise and knowledge, but also potentially the power to change replication policies in the field of political science. Uri Simonson is a professor of behavioral science at the ESADE Business School in Barcelona. And besides, in the behavioral topics he is interested in, he has published widely in the field of replication and replicability of quantitative data on meta-analysis and on B-registration and open science more generally. In addition, he's the co-editor of a blog called Data Collada. And this blog sets out to think about evidence and vice versa. And it has, beyond many other interesting things, a focus on replication on, of current and not so current articles. And maybe one of the most noteworthy failed replications posted on Data Collada indicated that a paper co-authored by one of the great figures of social psychology, Dan Ariely, actually fabricated data. As this has surely raised some debate in the field of social psychology and social sciences more generally, it will be especially interesting to hear from him his insights of the pros and cons of doing and publishing replication results. Finally, Last but surely not least, Sebastian Kalche is a research assistant professor and even more importantly, an associate director of the Qualitative Data Repository at Syracuse University. We are very happy to have Sebastian on board because not only he participates despite the fact that it's currently 6 a.m. in his time zone. So, uh, you know, heads on that. He has published widely on replication and replicability when it comes to qualitative data. And this is something that, in my view, is often overlooked in the debate on replication policies. In addition, Sebastian is an active contributor to several scholarly open source projects, including Sotero and its citations day language, and has taught wildly on digital technology and data management. As our other speakers, hence, he's also an expert in the field of research transparency and replication policies. And so, needless to say, we are very happy to have the three of you on board and we are very looking forward to the roundtable. Thanks from my side, back to Lisa. Yeah, thanks, Bernd. And yeah, I'm truly excited to have all three of you here as panelists. Um, to kick off this discussion, I wanted to know from you, um, how would you define replication, replicability? I know all of you have spent thoughts in various publications on that subject. Um, maybe we could start off with Uri, who has a precise paper actually on that on that topic. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. And I should start saying I'm, I'm not a political scientist, so I, I'm, I, I read it every once in a while some political science papers, but I'm an outsider to this community. 
uh, in terms of replic and, and then also in terms of qualitative research, and I know very little, so I, I look forward to learn. And I'm, I was thinking we probably have neglected to think enough about that as we've done work over the last 10 years in these issues. It, it's just, just a little foreign to us, so we just haven't been sufficiently attuned. So in terms of replication, um, how I think of it is, first, loosely speaking, the idea that if, if you in, in make it, drawing a distinction between rep reproducibility and replicability, two terms are sometimes defined in opposite ways. So I think of reproducibility as obtaining the same results with the same data, and replicability is obtaining the same results with new data. That's, 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 that's a loose sense. So, it's very serious when, when you have low reproducibility, meaning when you obtain the data the authors use and somehow there's an error in their code or, or something of that nature and just simply cannot reproduce what's in the paper. Um, but then, and replicability would be, you seek out, in that paper that you mentioned uh, that I, I wrote about replicability, it's, it, the idea is how do we test if a study has failed to replicate? What, what statistical standard could we use for that? And uh, one of my favorite parts of the paper that cut out at some point in the review process, which was the interaction motivating it. And, and it, it said something like, nobody really cares what happens in a, in a psychology experiment. It's, it's intrinsically uninteresting, right? Because you, you have 50 undergraduates making out an inconsequential decision. The, the, only reason, the only reason you care about that study is that you think it will replicate in some other study. Without replicability, that study has no value. And th that sort of idea to me is, it's, it's less, that's true in other contexts, like if you, if you study if you study an election, for example, maybe replicability is it, there's, not, there's a historical value to that fact on itself in a way that a 19 year old Ohio State psych major making you know choosing Coke or Pepsi does not. But to me, it's the, the corner sort of generating knowledge from a scientific perspective is that you can replicate it elsewhere. That's thanks, Vera. What is your take on this? Yes, um, thank you for inviting me for organizing this. Um, so nice to meet you guys, Sebastian, Uri. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, Bernd, I wish I had the power, right? <laughs> so if you have followed the Twitter feeds after I took over JOP, you might realize that there are many interests at stake and uh, there are many different interest groups that try to protect their turf. And so it's quite difficult to change the discipline, but uh, I'll try my best to go, especially in that direction of um, reproducibility and replicability. And so, so, and I find it really interesting what, what we just said. So his take on replicability, because of course, when you have experimental studies, then you have a very straightforward experimental study design. And if that is implemented with a different subject pool, then of course you hope that, or you will then replicability is clearly something that shows that results are within a certain statistical range, very, very similar to what we've found before. So when you come from kind of a more observational uh, side of uh, empirical analysis, where, for example, I uh, come from, and also many, many uh, papers that are published in PSM and in the JOP are actually uh, coming from, then really the question is, what is replicability other than just being able to reproduce the same results with the data provided by the authors or the researchers and the code they are providing, right? And unfortunately, this is exactly the only thing that journals do at the moment that they can do at the moment because it's, of course, also a question of resources, right? But also standards. So um, this is what journals do in terms of replicability also provide their data sets and the, their replication code. And then we have an analyst who goes through this and hopefully can reproduce exactly the same results as are presented in the article that we want to publish. So this is kind of the minimalist view in my, uh, in an observational sense of replicability. Of course, um, I wish that replicability actually meant to most of us what I would call robustness, right? Because of course, what we what we know and what we see is that um, that uh, of course uh, researchers when they uh, when they publish data, they have uh, they have to make many many choices, right? Um, they uh, um, 
you have to take into account that they have to take many decisions um, about estimation, right? What kind of estimation to use, what kind of procedures to use, and of course also a specification of their data models. And, and so when you read empirical studies, then you, you, it usually reads like um, that uh, the presented empirical specification is the only plausible one, right? And we know that this is not the case, right? And so, of course, robustness checks assume that alternative specifications uh, are not less plausible, right? And then we test whether results and conclusions hold using alternative specifications. The problem here, of course, is that um, we have come to this, uh, this position, this step, that many, many empirical papers present a lot of sensitivity and robustness uh, analysis, right? Um, but of course, again, it's a choice the researcher makes in, in what types of robustness check they're presenting. So in an ideal world, I think good replicability would be robustness checks and robustness checks would have uh, certain criteria, certain standards that we as a profession can agree on. And that, for example, a replication analyst of a journal could actually implement given the data, right? As I said, uh, clearly um, infeasible, and maybe can, and can, can talk about this a little bit later, basically mostly because we don't have the resources uh, as journal editors uh, to do so. But, but really what journals do here is key. And uh, as you said, Ben, the journals are at the forefront to, uh, to actually pushing this forward because journal editors have the power to do so, right? They have to have the willingness as well, but they have the power. And last but not least, um, replicability for me also is kind of what Uri called scientific progress, right? So we have a study that has actually tested a theory um, and implemented a, a certain analysis. And then, and then another study might come about and say, well, we are, we are using the same argument hypothesis that we want to test, but we are using different data in a different setting in a different context. And then we can find out whether the, the arguments we are making are context specific, right? And so here, things like not just scientific progress, right? We, we all know the, the next um, incumbency advantage uh, uh, study, we have seen them all. And you know, they are all in very small settings because of course, call the identification is very important. However, that in the end, where does this leave us, right? What kind of scientific progress have we made if uh, there is nobody who does an actual well-designed meta study, so to say, to put all these results together and, and we know where we stand in the field. So, so it's, direct re reproduction, it's uh, sensitivity and robust different specification, and last but not least, uh, diff uh, doing uh, similar research, but with different data and finding similar results. So the, the last one would not invalidate necessarily um, the results of a study, but would add to the scientific progress and the scientific knowledge that we have. And ideally, all three of them would mean replicability for me. Thank you. Amazing. That gives us a very good kickoff here. Uh, Sebastian, you're our expert also on how to do this with uh, data that we seemingly is a bit more tricky in this subject. And we come to this question on uh, asking how we can do replication with qualitative and quantitative um, studies. But just from a very get go, what do you understand um, thinking also about qualitative data? Uh, about replicability. How do you understand this concept here? Uh, good morning, first of all. Um, thanks so much for having me. This is exciting. I'll uh, mention that at some point around seven, probably I'll have a co-worker on my lab for some time while my wife is getting the other one ready for school. Um, and uh, as a good qualitative researcher, I, I want to start with some uh, conceptual analysis and a two by two table, if you will. 
And, and this is particularly important in political science because we have a past with the word replication, right? And Gary King's 1995 article, Replication, Replication, he defines what he calls the replication standard. And it turns out the replication standard is what by now everyone else in the world calls reproducibility. And that has caused an enormous amount of confusion in political science, right? In our data versus the most common data repository, uh, you have replication data for, but is this really replication data or is this a reproducibility data set? So the conceptual mess that Gary unwittingly, this, he was early in his time, but the conceptual mess that, they, that Gary continues to cause with this article um, until today is, is quite substantial. So I, uh, in kind of generally thinking about the terms, I. Uh, go fairly closely to what I think is the standard definition now that Uri uh, represented. And I, of course, think of this as a two by two table, which is, again, for a qualitative re uh, researcher professional responsibility. So you have same data, same code, you have reproducibility, uh, you have same data, different code. Uh, I would call that robustness checks. Um, you have um, different data, same code or same analysis, that's your replication analysis. And then if you want your, your bottom right field, you could call this an extension of the original study, right? Different study, uh, different uh, data. So that's kind of my conceptual analysis drawing on, on John Gehring's work also, uh, just, just to kind of have, have a little bit of clarity. And the argument that I've been making uh, with respect to qualitative data is that a lot of these terms fit poorly with how we do qualitative research. Um, and that's not controversial among qualitative researchers, uh, but that there is a transparency meta standard uh, that allows us to evaluate qualitative research uh, by similar categories that we can strive to and that we can uh, produce work and certainly more uh, materials towards that we should uh, aim to. And so one thing that I always say is that reproducibility, or as it's sometimes called computational reproducibility, in itself isn't actually all that interesting. What's relevant about, uh, about computational reproducibility for quantitative work, and Gary is actually very clear about this in his replication article, is that it actually is the most elegant way to show you exactly analytically what the authors did. And I would argue that scientifically, that's actually what we care about. And we don't have computer code in a qualitative analysis. Uh, so what I'm interested in is not to kind of somehow approximate uh, some mechanistic thinking in qualitative research, but to produce that type of transparency, to be as precise as possible about what the author did in the process. And, and so, so the argument that I'll kind of be making in various ways uh, throughout this conversation is that we should thrive for um, transparency as, as kind of the unifying meta standard uh, across different types of social science. And then I'm looking forward to kind of fleshing this out, how that, how that may look in, in different uh, ways for, for qualitative research and how it also relates to right, the multi-method research that we're seeing in a lot of political science, where I think that that dialogue is particularly interesting. Absolutely, yeah. Before we move on to this more in-depth discussion between qualitative and quantitative standards and maybe what standards you would define uh, on all of this, maybe we could um, switch in a more normative question. So how would you see replicability in terms, so what is the relationship between replicability and credibility? Um, where, where, is the, where is the line here and how is this, how is this relationship? How can we describe this relationship here? Um, Mary, do you want to start? Yes, thank you. Sure, sure, I'm happy to. So I'm also looking very much forward to, uh, to uh, hear more what Sebastian has to say about qualitative uh, replicability. And maybe we can talk also later because I know that HAPS is drawing on your expertise as well for, and, uh, and JOP has not, doesn't have a policy yet. So are we, we try to flesh out a policy and uh, we'll be getting there. 
But yes, um, replicability and credibility. Uh, I think this is a super important uh, question. We have the credibility crisis in the social sciences, right? And so, so the question is what type of credibility we are talking about. And I think that these are related. So the credibility of the empirical results that we are producing, and this of course directly leads to a question about the credibility or reputation of our profession, right? And uh, and I think, uh, so here replicability comes in because um, some fraudulent practices where we have seen, uh, you know, very famous cases in the past that actually really negatively affect the, uh, the reputation of our profession. And replicability comes in as one step towards trying to close the loopholes of potential uh, fraudulent um, research practices. And, um, and the problem here is, of course, that, um, that academic fraud is a little bit like doping, right? So, uh, of course, it provides you with means to get ahead. And uh, the uh, researchers who do honest work suffer both personally as well as uh, as a profession, right? So personally, in the sense that, of course, who uh, uh, you know, if you take the easy way, potentially you might be able to publish um, more and therefore um, get better jobs and so on. So you might actually suffer personally. And I'm not saying that this is standard, right? Um, uh, or actually uh, professionally, the whole profession, because reputation suffers of the whole profession. And that is really, really important because this has implications for um, the kind of resources we can receive from uh, political decision makers and so on, right? If they see that at the tip of the iceberg uh, that we produce fraudulent uh, uh, results, then of course, why would any taxpayer want to invest in research? And I think this is one of the bigger and more political questions that, that we are facing. Um, but yes, so rep replicability is kind of one step towards uh, closing this loophole in all the different versions that we have just talked about, right? Sebastian really characterized this very well as this two by two matrix. And, and um, but, but because uh, the problem here is really that uh, fraudulent behavior in academia is much more subtle than the, you know, well-known Lacour case, for example, because it is really um, more like, um, selective choice of cases that we can actually engage in or filling missing values at will, leaving out subjects from uh, experiments that do not fit our, uh, right, our, uh, so for example, in medical research, uh, we have seen this uh, before, or just strategic choice of estimation procedures, model specification, or you know, um, adapting research questions to uh, uh, adapting research questions and hypotheses to um, to the results that we are receiving, and of course, p hacking and uh, things like that that we are seeing. And so the problem here, um, the pure re reproduction of uh, of uh, of uh, results, will not solve that problem, right? And so this does not help to detect these subtle forms of um, of potential fraudulent uh, behavior. And so, of course, there's a combination of things that need to be done um, so that we can actually exert academic self-control, right? So the trust is good, but control is better. And academic self-control is really the thing that needs to be done here. And so there is a, there's a whole host of things uh, that uh, relate to this. So I'm just saying, pre-registration, pre-registered reports, publication of, of null results, um, uh, publication of uh, data, even though we might talk about this, this might have limitations when you have personalized data and um, sensitive data and so on, replication, but also verification of formal proofs and formal work. Um, and then of course, robustness and sensitivity checks and uh, and then, um, and again, this brings me back to resources, 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 and we might talk about this also a little bit more, but I think, yeah, so replicability is, is closely related to credibility, but it is just one part of the whole package that will lead us to 
um, producing more credible results and therefore being as a profession credible to the outside. Amazing. Um, Uri, you have a very, you developed um, a very cool tool, P-curve. Um, maybe you could talk about this a bit in this, in the context of this question. How could this help us to make our discipline more credible? Uh, sure. So let, let me, I'll, I'll answer first the, the original question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the curve. So, because you had, you had in, in the question as was sent to us, it was like what the causal relationship, I think, was between credibility and replication. So thinking about that, and I'm not usually Bayesian in, in my statistical preference, but I was, I was thinking of a Bayesian argument, which is how, how do you update when, you, when something fails to, to replicate? And if, if the research is credible, then you update about the world. You, you say, oh, I guess this is not a general phenomenon, or maybe there's an interesting moderator here, or maybe things have changed. And it used to be true, but it's not true anymore. But when the research is not credible, then your inference is about the research. So you say, if this doesn't replicate, then I'm going to update about how the work was originally done. And so I think in, in an environment where research is credible, we, we update differently in, in light of replication. So a failure to replicate is not bad news. If the original is credible, you can be very, and I think this was touched upon earlier, I forget who was uh, Vera Sebastian who was make, making a similar point that you, you may learn that um, this doesn't generalize to this population or, or this is no longer true. But that kind of inference requires trust in the original, in the original finding. Now, in terms of, of, of Picker, it's a tool we, we developed some years ago. And it can be used to, as a sort of a shortcut to assessing the credibility of, of, a, of a variety of findings. It's, it's, it's in a spirit of meta-analysis. You could even argue this meta-analysis depends how you think of it, of how you define meta-analysis. But basically, you can take any set of any set of studies that have been evaluated through statistical significance, where the p-value is a key target for the researcher, and ask whether, as a whole, this literature is sort of significant as a, taking into account selective reporting. So it, it takes into account the file drawer, meaning that you only see things if they're significant, and it takes into account p-hacking, which is you only see the analysis that are significant. So you can take a literature with 20 findings and submit them to the to PK analysis, which is, it simply analyzes the distribution of p-values that are published. And, and you can learn that actually as a whole, they don't, they don't have evidence against the null, they don't support the existing ignoring effect. And uh, the, it was somewhat controversial, it was quite controversial when we first started working on it, because people saw it as, as going, after, going after researchers. And certainly some people have used that tool or similar tools to do exactly that. But it has a lot of uses that are, are less sort of vigilante justice in spirit. So one of my favorite uses is uh, to be a researcher and they have a finding and the finding contradicts some literature. So the, the, the journal pushes back and says, well, you have to explain. You have to explain why you get A and they get not A. And going back to the city of credibility, if, if you, and, and the, the, this first use was suggested, as, and it was done by a friend of mine. Uh, he peekered that literature and said, well, that, that literature as a whole does not have evidential value. So it's not really on me to explain why my finding contradicts it, because my finding does have evidential value and the other one does not. So it's not, he didn't, that didn't, didn't even make it to the paper. It just was part of the argumentation with the review process of why this new fact that seemed to contradict prior facts. Uh, was admissible or didn't require further justification. That neatly outlines the, <laughs> the process and maybe how it should not look like sometimes. Thanks so much. And uh, now we are all waiting, super excited also for your um, take on this, yeah. Sebastian, how you would, yeah. Find I, I guess I, I want to make two points. One uh, go, goes back to uh, the tr transparency uh, part, uh, which is that uh, to the extent that we're actually interested in catching fraud, neither reproducibility nor replicability help us a lot, right? If uh, people think back to LeCour, A, his work was reproducible, and uh, B, uh, somewhat ironically, it turned out that in Brockman and Kalla's work, uh, it actually replicated in an extension. Uh, so it passed both of those 
um, both of those markers, yet it was um, fraudulent. And the reason that was possible for Brockman Kala to find out was, of course, transparency, right? Um, it was a, the data was ability, so they could do the type of detective work, detective work that Uri and his team at Data Collider are also well known for. Um, uh, and then they uh, went further and kind of got additional information, and that often matters, right? Providing additional information, say which survey firm did you use, was I was I think the the kind of the thing that uh, got Lacour to fall. Um, and so by providing those additional transparency bits of information, to the extent that we are interested in catching fraud, that's what helps us. I don't think this is the interesting debate. There will be fraud. It will be hard to catch. We'll hopefully catch some of it. But, but I don't really want to be part of a social science that's principally interested in catching fraud. And that's not, you know, uh, to say that work like Brockman, Carlos, or Ori's and catching cases of fraud isn't isn't important. But I don't think that should be our day-to-day -day focus and in, in how we do um, work. Uh, so, so moving on to replication, I think qualitative researchers tend to be quite comfortable with work not replicating in the closed sense. So if I got to find something different to in a related study to you, I don't actually necessarily even think that you've done something wrong. Um, there is just such an incredible wealth of possible information and roads of, of analysis that I can take if I approach the type of big questions that qualitative work does, right? Like, how does labor incorporation affect the party system in Latin America? Like, big question, 2000 ways I can analyze this. There's going to be different outcomes depending on uh, even what variables I look at, what time frames I look at, et cetera. So I'm generally quite comfortable with that. There is also, of course, and that's something that's perhaps even more unique to qualitative work, uh, a much stronger focus on positionality. And that's especially uh, for interpret interpretive work where the researcher directly inter acts with their environment. And so think ethnography as perhaps the most popular form of that in political science, where I spent um, right a year, two years, three years deeply embedded in interacting uh, with a community. Uh, who I am as a person in various, various ways obviously hugely matters um, about the types of things that I find in that type of research. And so if I, as a German white, cis, et cetera, person go into a community that will be very different than um, someone who is say a black woman going into the same uh, community and interacting uh, with them. And so I don't, I don't expect that to uh, replicate. And I don't think that's a problem for the cred credibility of qualitative research, as long as you're uh, transparent and in the and ethnographers have been quite good about being transparent about uh, and reflective about the role that their positionality plays in uh, shaping their research. So in that sense, I think uh, less important for credibility. But um, I do think we have to get it right. And some I, I I do think, and there I diverge from some parts of qualitative research, but I don't think most political science qualitative researchers, there are some facts about the world that that um, may be socially constructed, but exists in a kind of tangible uh, way. And and we want to if we want to talk to each other about research, we need to get these right. And and so there is uh book that caused quite a stir in ethnography circles, uh, 19, uh, uh, 2017 book by a law professor, Stephen Libet, who looked at prominent ethnographic works uh, and kind of did fact checking on them, essentially. And uh, some did quite well and some did quite poorly. And this is very contested in ethnography circles. But I think as a reader, I I want to be clear about, you know, what types of things actually happened. What types of things did you hear about as you write about the ethnography? What types of things are speculations, right? And that goes back to transparency. I want to be uh, clear about um, what's true and what's not. And I want to be clear about what can be verified, uh, say, with uh, through other record, what uh, dovetails, say, press reports at the time uh, or those sorts of things. So in that sense, kind of, um, 
checking whether whether things check uh, check out with uh, with the record. There is there is some. I was trained as a political economist, and so when I was in graduate school, one of the big debates was uh, on do uh, what's the role of capitalists and business in shaping uh, in shaping the welfare state in Sweden. And there was a very fierce debate between uh, Peter Svensson and Walter Corpy about you know. Uh, Svensson argued it was really enlightened capitalists in Sweden who kind of in cross-class alliances helped build the Swedish welfare state. And Walter Karpi, a good Swedish socialist, was like, nah, they were against it the whole time. Uh, and it was just the forcefulness of the Swedish labor movement uh, who uh, made the welfare state. But what it boiled down to was who had the right reading of the uh, of the archival records that they looked at. And, and so I don't think anyone ever did that. There are some examples where people did, uh, but I think replication in that sense is, you know, going deeper into the archive and uh, looking more closely at the archival evidence, probably still gonna have an interpretive um, a debate there, but, but I do think there are, there are, you know, standards for archival methods. So there, there is a right to be had there. And then, going long, but the last thing that I want to say, kind of going back to transparency, and this is something that I'm borrowing from, from uh, Arthur Lupia in terms of credibility, his point is that what makes us as social scientists different from other people who claim to create knowledge, journalists, pundits, etc., is that we have uh, structured, well-established and public rules that we follow in how we obtain knowledge. And that's what makes transparency so crucial to that. So the reason why what we do is more credible than uh, what uh, David Brooks writes in the New York Times is not that we're smarter than David, but is that as a community, we agree on, on a set of rules uh, that we follow in a way that other people can check on. And that makes us vulnerable to criticism and that also makes us more credible. That's an amazing uh, a connection to the next question, actually. And Sebastian, maybe I'll let you go first before your co-worker arrives. Uh, and also to kick off the discussion on the standards that you just mentioned. So what, how do they differ? How does um, qualitative and quantitative research differ in terms of replication and replicability? And maybe we focus also on transparency because that uh, seems to be our ultimate goal here. Um, yeah, so uh, a couple of ideas, and I kind of want to explore them rather than kind of try to give, give you the, the truth here. But uh, one thing is that it depends on what qualitative research, right? Uh, so if I'm kind of someone who looks at qualitative research really mainly as a sense-making exercise kind of in the interpretive ethnograph uh, ethnographic spirit, um, I should be evaluated by quite different standards than if uh, I am doing, say, a case study to establish the assumptions of a natural experiment that then uh, claims to make a quantitative causal um, uh, causal claim, right? Those are, those are both valid purposes for qualitative research, in my opinion, uh, but one should be evaluated by standards that I think are quite similar to those of quantitative work because it's tightly integrated, it, is, it operates in the exact same epistemological work, a world, whereas the other uh, should be subject to quite different uh, standards um, in terms of how it's evaluated. So that's that's point number one. Qualitative research is incredibly diverse, and we are kind of, I would argue, fortunate in political science to have the almost entire range of, of qualitative epistemologies and approaches present in our field. And rather than trying to kind of squeeze parts of that out, we should celebrate that and, and, uh, and evaluate research in a way that, that does that diversity justice. Um, the second part is that I would argue, in spite of that, the transparency standard should hold for almost all of this. And so what I mean by transparency standard is somewhat adjust, adjustable again for the types of methods that you use, say for an ethnographer positionality and reflexivity would be much more important than for someone who, who works in a mixed method study uh, uh, that's very kind of positivist in outlook. Um, but 
overall things like think about what data can be made safe, uh, safely made available. And there are limits here, right? Qualitative research typically is very rich. The identification isn't always possible. Like even if I try hard, if I work with elites, the identification is essentially not possible. Uh, uh, even if um, I don't work with elites, if I work in certain contexts, it's just too risky, right? If I work in the Middle East or in China, uh, do I really want to take that risk that someone can maybe re-identify after all and throw someone in jail or worse because of the research data I published? Probably not. Um, IRBs won't let you anyway. Um, so, so there are certainly strong limits to this. But I think we should at least be willing to think about which data can be made available. And if I think about what that means for transparency, that doesn't mean that someone can go in necessarily and replicate my work, right? Or even reproduce my work because the data is only part of what makes the qualitative uh, research. There's other, there's the personality of the researcher. There's other things that aren't say in the written record that are intangible, uh, visual cues, uh, recollections, the experience of being in a certain place at a certain time, those sorts of things. But if someone presents a certain interview quote uh, in their research, and then I read the entire interview, and it seems to contradict the entire sense of, of the research, or it doesn't really make sense in the context of the broader interview, I really do, or it seems cherry picked, um, given 10 other interviews. I, I do think that's a problem. And, and I do think allowing for that scrutiny where it's possible is important. So that's point number one. And point number two is, and I think qualitative research isn't doing as much as it should in some cases there, is spending more time being descriptive about our methods, both in terms of fields methods and in terms of analysis. And there are some exceptional examples of this. If you look at the qualitative transparency uh, deliberations, uh, several of the, um, of the papers there cite some, some outstanding examples of say, how does a great um, methodological appendix for uh, interpretive fieldwork uh, look. And that's a lot of work. And sometimes qualitative researchers complain about that and say, well, we have to do that. Quantitative researchers don't. I think quantitative researchers do too. And when I see experimentalists with their 200 pages methodological appendices, I think essentially we need to do this too, but we are not at a point where we have good standards. So everyone is kind of making this up as they go. And I think that's one area where there's really room for advancements. They won't always look the same. Again, diverse field. So ethnographic appendix will look very different from another one and that's fine, but kind of thinking a little bit more about what should be in there, what should I expect um, is I think a, a very good idea and would move us forward. Thank you, that's amazing. So Mary, you also spent quite some thoughts on the differences between quantitative and qualitative research in terms of replication, replicability, and transparency. So what, what do you think uh, in terms of these questions? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I honestly uh, believe that, yeah, replicability is uh, really key, but I fully agree with what Sebastian says that this, this meta standard of transparency is uh, is what unites both qualitative and quantitative research, and and I think um, what this would mean for me as a journal editor would mean publication, right? Publication of data, publication of uh, of um, what I would call kind of a coding scheme, and uh, and uh, of course. Uh, um, a replication file that explains exactly how I came from the raw data to the results that I'm presenting and interpreting. And this kind of process is might differ for qualitative and quantitative research, but that is the process that needs to be publicized, right? And this is, of course, again, where potentially um, Publication outlets and editors of publication outlets are key because they have to develop these standards also potentially against some 
you know, pushback that we might see from, and we had the exact same pushback in, in, uh, in with uh, quantitative research, right? And we still do, but when I look at where we have uh, come to in terms of being able to, uh, to enhance transparency, I still fully agree with, with what everybody said that reproduction is only, you know, a very small, um, uh, part of the whole replicability puzzle, but it's one step in the right direction. And when I actually look back at when we introduced replication, reproduction, and publication of replication code uh, for PSRM about 10 years ago, um, then I just looked it up. We did yearly reports on this, and there are 90% of the submitted replication file did not replicate, right? So even though the authors knew that they would actually have to not just upload everything on the dataverse, right? But also that there is actually an, uh, an analyst replicating this. So running the code and checking whether the results match, um, the code did not run, right? And quite often, of course, it was small things like version changes, uh, you know, file directories that were not correctly implemented and all kinds of these smaller things. And this has completely changed, right? Now, when we do that at JOP, 99% of the code run, right? The, the code runs. So you actually run the code and you get the results at the end. And so this is quite, quite some, uh, this is not a small step. This is not a small uh, step that we have made against, you know, pushback. And I think this will also hold true for if we demand this from qualitative research. And I agree, there's a wide variety of uh, qualitative research. And, you know, Sebastian know, knows this much better than I do, that different standards there have to apply. But transparency about the research process which includes actually also for qualitative research to think, think much more about a research design where this qualitative research process fits in. And then, you know, it uh, generates actually a replicable process, research process is really important. And I still hold that qualitative research that actually aims at making influences, which is only a small part granted of qualitative research, which, which is actually uh, focused on hypothesis testing and making influences, that this type of qualitative research needs to necessarily adhere to the same standards as quantitative research that engages in hypothesis testing. And so, so we have to still flesh out the standards a little bit better but uh, there are these initiatives, right? The DART initiative that uh, with Skip Lupia and others who, uh, so the, 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 you know, Sebastian, you know this better, the, the, the repository, the qualitative uh, data repository that works on this. I'm just looking back that I know that HMPS started to actually try to generate common standards for qualitative uh, uh, research and replication of this potentially also 10 years back, right? And in 2019, when Jen Lili already had taken over, the first article was published that actually was fully, the first qualitative article was published that was fully replicated. And also here we see really a lot of move and push in the right direction, right? But I completely agree that it is a little bit more difficult to uh, actually formulate those common standards for, uh, for qualitative research, especially this qualitative research that is more ethnographic, that is more um, hypothesis generating and theory generating on the more inductive side of things and not on the uh, deductive side of things. Um, however, what really the transparency aspect of things and the publication of uh, data generation and interpretation processes is, uh, is, is key to generate this replicability and the awareness in the whole profession that this is a good thing, right? It's not, it's not okay, it generates a little bit of uh, more work, but also it's collectively a good thing because it enhances the credibility again of the results we are producing and therefore of the profession as a scientific 
way of uh, generating knowledge. Thank you. Uri, to, to make this, to step up a bit on this question, um, we are always talking about how qualitative um, studies should should meet the quantitative standards on, on all of these, but but reflecting on, on, on the standards in quantitative research, what do you think, what, what should the standards be and are there limits or did we already achieve these standards or where are we on, in, this, in this path here, in this trouble? <laughs> Well, there's there's enormous variability in, in terms of how much movement there's been. Uh, I've, I found those numbers where I wasn't sharing quite encouraging. And I'm, I'm more in, in the psychology and business schools uh, world. And then in, in psychology, you see there's one journal, which is one of the leading journals, Psychological Science, that has made in, in just incredible progress. It, it, when the replication crisis started in 2010, it was almost, it was almost a punchline to have a paper in Psychological Science because they had just incredible claims that were poorly supported from a, from a statistical perspective. And now they have something like 60, 70% of studies that are pre-registered at similar rates of sharing uh, data and code and just um, an openness to publish failures to replicate and an openness to publish um, studies with a methodological contribution within an existing paradigm that simply makes the existing claims that were not justified, but now they're justified with the right analysis, just sort of from a, a reformer's perspective, ideal. but there are other journals, for example, within the business world, marketing tends to be closer to, to my interests uh, from the research perspective. And there you've seen very little movement in terms of how things have changed. So it's, and I think part of the reason is it's, it's very much um, a movement even though it's a, it's a grassroots movement, it really requires somebody with power to take on uh, their peers. Like for example, in psych psychological science case, we happened, so, we, so I've done all this work with Leif Nelson and Joe Simmons, and we had written a paper starting our interest in this field. And we had a conference in uh, Seattle and the editor of psych science was in Vancouver. So we invited him for lunch. And we drove up to Vancouver and met with him for two or three hours. And we think we persuaded him that this was a good idea. And he took on his entire editorial board, which was not on board and worked on it for two years until he got, he had the political skills that we, that we did not. And he got this sort of through the finish line. And in a lot of journals, you don't have, his name is Eric Ike, he's uh, still at the ABC. You, you need Eric Ike's in journals for things to change. And, and so I think that's the reason it's so heterogeneous in, with, across disciplines and across journals within a discipline. Okay. Uh, there are many more questions I could ask, but there are also already questions in the, in the audience. So um, let's tackle these and then um, maybe, um, yeah, you can discuss amongst yourself a bit more on all of these issues. So I hand over to Bernd for taking some of the q and questions. Yeah, I mean, there are four questions uh, up to now. And uh, the first question, Vera has already signaled that she wants to answer this question. So I just read it out aloud from uh, Rob Eckrill. And, and um, he, states, he states, I love Vera's fraud doping analogy, but to what extent do John editors have a role to play here? Unless there is greater acceptance of negative or null results as being a valid part of research, won't precious remain to find data and results that journals want to publish? Yeah, thank you. This is a hugely important question and I fully agree that this is one of the major problems. Um, Colin's question, the fourth question, I guess, relates to this and I might try to answer both of the, uh, these questions from my point of view as a journal editor. Well, um, yes, we, we all know the problem. That, and this is a problem of the discipline and the profession as a whole, right? Everybody, uh, every uh, profession that does empirical research, we all have these file draw papers, right? So a bunch of papers that sits there where we actually thought we had a good research idea and in the end, the empirical data analysis didn't pan out and did not produce significant results, right? And we didn't p-hack and we didn't, we just put it in the file drawer because we knew most journals wouldn't publish null findings, especially if they are not experimental but observational. And so, so clearly there, there's a question of 
yes, journal editors and people in power have to make moves toward, um, you know, a uh, trying to publish more of these null and negative results, and but also publishing data papers, replication analysis, as we just said. So these kind of things are important. Um, but we have to do this in a structured way, right? Because of course, what we uh, in the end want is uh, that no scientific knowledge um, is lost and, and the research we are doing is both efficient and effective. What I mean by efficient is that, well, I might actually start a research project not knowing that 10 people already had the same idea but didn't find any results and these results weren't published and landed in the file drawer, right? So what we are trying to do, and we are clearly not the first uh, ones who try to do this, is um, actually we're having a trial next year to publish or to accept pre-registered reports, right? And so they, they, they already um, the DART movement, uh, Skip Lupia and Brendan Nyhan started this uh, 10 years ago. And uh, I signed up for this uh, when I was, uh, editor of PSM, and there there was basically uh, uh, basically no resonance in the in the community. Right, I received in that year that we actually signed up to the trial two submissions that were actually taking part in this trial pre-registered reports. Um, the CPS has done this a few years ago, where it's not very great results, um, but there are more and more trials in this area, and what we see is that. Uh, what the problems were before, what we learned from these previous trials is that we need much better instructions uh, for both authors as well as reviewers of these pre-registered reports. But clearly pre-registered reports is a step in the right direction because what we're doing here, we are accepting research based on everything but the empirical results, right? Based on is that a great research question? Does it fit our audience? Does it speak to a broader audience in political science? Do we like the argument, the theory, the research design, right? And once we say yes to this and also think this paper is actually well written and will be read by a wide audience, then we can accept this with, without having seen the results. And then of course, then uh, this really links back to what Uri said before. Then of course, based on these type of results, even though there might be null results, we are not making inferences about the research design, the peer hacking or whatever, but we are making inferences about the world around us, right? So even if you find null results in these pre-registered reports in an ideal world, we learn from this, and will change potentially our arguments, our theories, and then put this to the test again. And so, so this is one very structured move in the direction of being able to credibly publish null and negative results. And uh, this is what we are doing next year. I hope a lot of you will actually submit pre-registered reports. I, again, I know this is just a very small step in the direction of publishing null results because it is focusing on a certain type of empirical research, basically everything that has to do in some way with experiments, right? Experimental research um, that have an experimental design, vignettes, surveys, and so on. Um, of course, we need to move forward and also think about how we can do similar things with observational studies. The problem is, of course, the one criterion that is important uh, when we accept this type of research is that the researcher cannot have their hands on the data before they submit uh, their research design. And this is, of course, a little bit more difficult in, uh, in observational research. So. So, so everything we have said about uh, uh, everything we have said about fraud and potentially fraudulent behavior is, of course, also then um, applying to pre-registered reports if researchers had their hands on the data uh, before and can uh, adapt their questions to the results. And uh, so, but yeah, I think, so this is one step in that direction. And uh, I fully agree, this is one of the really important things, giving more credit to data collection and data provision, um, giving more credit to uh, replication analysis and giving more credit to uh, well done and informative null results.
Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, we we have other questions more regarding to Sebastian. And Sebastian also agreed to answer them. Uh, the first question is about um, your statement, Sebastian, that you have uh, been asking from being more descriptive about um, the qualitative methods. Um, however, uh, Regina Weber sees problems with the 8,000 words limit of uh, papers in most journals. So um, there, there seems to be always a problem with the length and qualitative papers. And I think uh, Regina says that it's a structural problem, given that we need more space to present, for example, interview quotes. How, how should we tackle this in the future? Um, yeah, so so I it's seven o'clock. I've been up for an hour, so now I'm going to start being controversial. Um, uh, so so if you are a journal and you want cutting edge qualitative work and you write 8000 uh, words as your word limit, you're signaling to qualitative researchers that they're not welcome. Uh, cutting edge qualitative work does not happen in 8,000 words. Um, we can't have, you know, if we want to write small books, which we all can, uh, journal isn't a good place, but you can, there's a very clear and not coincidental correlation with, between journals that allow 10 to 12,000 words and journals uh, that publish uh, the best qualitative research. You don't print that much anymore. Most of it happens electronically. A couple thousand extra words uh, won't hurt you. You want great qualitative research, give qualitative researchers the space they need uh, to, to do that. That said, uh, I think part of the methodological part needs to happen uh, outside the article uh, itself, right? Just the way it does for, uh, for quantitative uh, work. Um, so, so the details of data collection uh, and, and research, uh, depth of research design at some point uh, should go into some sort of appendix. Some of you may know I'm, I'm one of the things that QDR is working on is this idea uh, of ATI, we call it Annotation for Transparent uh, Inquiry that dovetails on Andy Moravchik's works on active citations. So essentially the ability to annotate specific sections of the article rather than having a static a 100 page appendix where you don't feel uh, where you never find the relevant part so so kind of making that speak a little better to qualitative research um but that still means right as regina rightly points out uh writing a couple of informative quotes uh that give you sense of the interviews takes more space it takes more work and and if you want that type of work um you need to allow the space for it. And to go on with that, right, Vera mentioned rightly that AJPS has some guidelines for qualitative uh, replication, and it took 10 years uh, for them to be used. And that's not a coincidence because AJPS doesn't get a lot of quantitative work, neither does JOP. Uh, APS are slightly more, but not that much more either. So that's the three often so referred to as top three journals, although qualitative researchers would disagree. Um, and uh, if, you want, if you want to push the debate forward, if you want, uh, again, qualitative transparency kind of mainstreamed, uh, you know, don't just do a registered report trials, uh, have an entire special issue of JOP or AJPS for advances in transparent uh, qualitative research. Uh, don't pump, uh, don't publish any quant in that uh, journal and uh, you'll advance the debate. Uh, plus, uh, you'll signal to researchers that you're open for uh, submissions of high quality qualitative work, which they currently don't believe for, I'm sorry, either JOP or AJPS. Uh, I promise to be controversial. Uh, and uh, Johnson's question, I actually fully, I, I'm just going to say that I fully agree with uh, what, what he's saying. Uh, and I, I hope I made that clear. If So the question by Johnson is, does replicability make sense for qualitative discourse analysis for the same question that these researchers have different understandings and interpretations for the data they are now analyzed? And that's exactly the problem with uh, kind of replication standards per se for interpretive research. If your goal is interpretation, your interpretations are going to differ and that's fine. Uh, they do make, they do have to make sense, right? Even if, if I think of literary scholars, kind of the interpreters per excellence, you can't just say whatever you want based on the text. It still needs to be rooted in the text, but it's fine if different people arrive at different interpretations. Vera. 
Yes, thank you. I just want to quickly come back to what Sebastian said. And I think a little bit of controversy is great and challenging the big three to actually broaden their their view on different types of research is also really important. Um, just, just to come quickly uh, back to this, of course, yes, a lot is published online, but of course, I'm not the master of the page limit, right? So that's, uh, that's actually the publisher. So in this case, it's University of Chicago Press. They give us a certain page limit that is negotiated with the SPSA who pays for that. Right. So, and then of course, uh, we have to also be aware that, uh, uh, impact factors are calculated uh, by, right? So if it's, it's all kind of a question of, uh, so I, I'm fighting fights on different kind of fronts uh, every single day, right? I have the same discussions with political theorists who push back a lot on page limits, for example. Um, what we have actually done at JOP is not, um, implement a strict page limit at submission stage, right? Um, so so if you submit a paper that is longer, you can well do so, so because that, of course, then gives the reviewers enough uh, space and you can actually use that space to tell the reviewers how your research looks like and why it's important to use that space. But in the end, right, uh, we have a page limit with the publisher and we want to publish all types of research. So in the end, we then add, once we have accepted the paper, we try to cut it back down to the around 8,000 words, right? But we, we grant uh, exceptions to that as well, if there is a good reason for that. And so everybody can make an argument why they need a little bit more space than just the 8,000 words. But I would fully agree that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, Questions of applicability can be that can be uh, can be dedicated to other spaces, right? An appendix, an online appendix, and referred to in the paper, which does not preclude of, or which does not uh, solve the problem of having to uh, use more space space for voting interview questions. Um, well, we are not doing special issues, right? We don't have the space in the journal for doing. We never do uh, in in no area of political science, we, uh, the JOP does special issues because we are getting 1400 submissions every year and we publish less than 10% of those, right? So it's uh, special issues is a really great idea, but uh, it also then again will generate a lot of you know, questions from other interests or other subfields, why we would now just then we would have special issues every issue of the, of the year. And uh, so it's just a question of balance as well. But I fully agree that JOP is not the place or not seen as the place to publish um, the, the frontier of uh, qualitative work. But I'm open, we are open to actually look at qualitative papers and maybe we have almost a hundred people in here. Maybe I can get the message out that uh, please send us your uh, qualitative papers. And, and then I come back to Sebastian and we see how we can actually make them replicable as well. Thanks, sorry. Thanks. There is Another follow-up question on the qualitative uh, data thingy, and um, I try to summarize it. But um, Sue, if I if I miss summarize it, please please uh, come back with a follow-up question. But the, the main thing seems seems to be that the more qualitative researchers are open about their data, the, the more they open up the raw data, the more they they get into problems of anonymity, and you know. You know, as you mentioned already, Sebastian, you know, will open up their sources, will make their sources identifiable. So, in, especially in, in, you know, autocratic contexts, this seems to be a, a big problem. So, how to deal with that? Maybe also from an editor side, how to protect the sources on the one side and how to guarantee transparency of research on the other side. So, is there a, you know, a balance which we can ha have? or uh, equal weight to, to both parameters. Um, Sebastian. Yeah, from my perspective, this is a very hard question, but I think parts of it aren't that hard, right? Parts of transparency are not raw data or not data at all, 
right? So, and there's actually a fair amount of consensus if you read, again, the qualitative transparency deliberations that what DART calls production transparency uh, is important and uncontroversial for qualitative research. So writing a great appendix that outlines exactly how you collected data, how you selected uh, informants, uh, how you analyzed, got from transcript to, uh, to argument, those sorts of things doesn't endanger anyone, does a huge amount for transparency, arguably as much, if not more, uh, than the data in some cases, depending on the article. Uh, so, so that part is hard work, but doesn't pose the types of ethical issues that Sue uh, mentions. In terms of the ethical issue, uh, issues, um, for one, I think reviewers typically don't see raw data in political science. That's different in other disciplines, but uh, including for quant, uh, it's typical for, for the data to be posted on acceptance and not uh, during review. I think uh, political analysis might be the only journal, major journal that I know of that does that differently. Um, so so for, for the review process, that's less of an issue. Uh, but for the data on acceptance, we need to think hard about uh, how, how to do this fairly, right? Um, and generally, the current APSA position is that the author has the last word. The author is the only person in the, the right position to um, decide whether the data can be safely practiced. In general, I think that is probably right because they have the contextual knowledge but there is of course some sort of moral hazard problem because if you can get out of the work of publishing the data which it is by just saying that nah, can't be done it's qualitative it's too sensitive that also creates the very easy out so um having some way to to push back or some standards you know these data should really be publishable doesn't seem particularly controversial. Uh, those sorts of things would seem to be possible, but it's very tricky because you're also, of course, interacting with the regulatory framework in the US. The IRBs are governed by federal law. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's a very delicate place to tread. So, so requiring data submissions uh, tricky. The, the other thing to note is that data repositories, one thing that we think we are great at is protecting sensitive data by uh, by managing access requests. ICPSR, of course, for quantitative data does an amazing job with that. And we're pushing that heavily to where data are sensitive, right? Just because the data are in a repository doesn't mean everybody on the internet can just download them. And we're able to safeguard data and provide a controlled access where that's necessary. And that's absolutely commensurate with, uh, with uh, transparent research, right? As long as you know how to get to the data once you've complied with the ethical requirements, that's just as transparent as for uh, public data. Um, on the same topic, Uri, you're, you're coming from a psychological background, right? So, I mean, this must also be a topic in the psychological field of work, actually, because you also have some qualitative data and, uh, and uh, you know, data sources may be even more vulnerable than are the sources in, in political science. So is there any recommendation by the side of APA or something like that? So which we can, which we may learn of? I don't, I don't think so, because it, it, there's a vague directive of not posting identifiable information, but that's not very, it's not made explicit what, what that entails. Um, so I, I co-host uh, a site that is like Dataverse. It's called Research Box. And one thing we do is when you upload files there, the, the server runs a bunch of checks on the data. So it reads the, it reads the actual data file and it looks for patterns. So it will block people from uploading IP addresses, uh, phone numbers, email addresses, latitude, longitude. And it, it, will, it will tell the researcher, you know, this file contains this identified information. You can overrule the rubber. So you can, you can say, no, no, you made a mistake. This is a false positive, in which case an actual person that takes a look at the file. But for the kinds of things you're talking about, like um, qualitative work you know, with political activists, uh, that's, it's not the kind of grade of privacy or you know, security that we're talking about. We're, we're talking about uh, you know, somebody on, completes a survey and, and, and talks about a fight they had with their mother. And then and in, other, in another survey, you, you can start triangulating and figuring out who that person is. Um, 
but it, the stakes are much lower. And, and I think that's why the concern has been less again. In fact, the, the OSF, which is another large repository of data, has hundreds of files that include IP addresses and even email addresses. And th there hasn't been a, a scandal yet of, of any kind. So this, the stakes are just lower given the nature of the, of the data being collected. Yeah, maybe I can come quickly in as a as a, from the from again the editorial side. Um, of course, um, uh, I see this problem especially with uh, qualitative uh, data, but uh, do we have the same problem with quantitative data as well? Right, a lot is sensitive data. We have a lot of secure lab data, for example, where you have, for example, individualized labor market data and so on, where, for example, in, in the UK, you only can go physically to a secure lab to analyze the data there. And then um, you can only take out your results tables and these results tables are checked uh, beforehand by analysts in the secure lab that uh, they do not uh, um, allow any identification of individuals. And uh, so, of course, uh, somebody submits a paper using sensitive and secure lab data, then uh, we also have to say exact same problem, how do we do application, right? And uh, so up until now, what we are doing, of course, is uh, if a paper is replicated, right, it gets the stamp that it has been replicated by the JOP data analyst. Uh, analyst. And so for the sensitive data, what we do, of course, we allow people not to publish their data, right, on a dataverse, the raw data. But of course, as Sebastian said, they have to actually publish um, the process, every step of the way, how the data was gathered. And if somebody wanted to gather the same data, they can use exactly these guides, this guideline uh, to, to actually gather the same data and do the same analysis. But what we do is that in these cases, our replication analyst will be part of the team who gets secure lab access. And we even had uh, uh, back in PSRM days, somebody traveled to Sweden to go there to the secure lab and do the replication actually in order, I mean, again, resources, right? It's really an important issue here. Um, uh, but this all is feasible, and that is what we are doing now. Now, most secure lab data is also available through, is through VPNs and these types of things. And um, so, so here we do the same thing. Um, they have to uh, uh, basically publish the web reproduction guide, but uh, our data anal analyst will actually do the replication in the secure lab space. And something, I guess, something similar would be feasible in a qualitative setting, right, where only this one person is added to and why uh, assigns a non-disclosure or something like that, right, and is added to kind of the research team and be able to do, to check whether data is replicable, whether results are replicable, whether, you know, every step of the process has been, um, is transparent uh, in a qualitative research design setting as we do in a quantitative research design setting. So while I see that this is time intensive and uh, hard work, I think these things are feasible and we have to actually explore the routes to do so. And we do one thing that is our data replication analysts through the replication in a secure space and then um, uh, uh, with the replication files, excluding the raw data, we also uh, have a node on the dataverse and on the published paper that this, this results have been replicated by uh, our analysts. So add this additional credibility um, uh, to, to the results, even if the data is sensitive and cannot be published. Maybe I use my authority as being the one who asked the question to, to submit one of my questions and it somehow connects to a question that, that Lisa and I were talking about uh, beforehand. So it's like, I'm teaching a lot of methods. I'm teaching also in the method school, but I stumbled, you know, only over a few instances of courses doing replication analysis. So in your experience, and this, is, this goes to all three of you, so should we also increase the number of courses also already on the master's or even bachelor level who, you know, teaches how to do replication analysis? Should we 
you know, provide students with the knowledge of how to do reproducibility and replicability. And is this, is this a good way or do we just increase distrust among students in published findings? So is there a negative side to it or is there a mainly positive side to, to including replication into teaching notes? I can sorry take a shot of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry <laughs> so um so i think reproducibility so that we're running um same data with same code i i think we, that's how we should teach statistics really um if, if you're learning regression you should be reproducing if you're running a logistic if you're using cluster scenarios whatever you should, you should be taking a, a, an actual paper and then ideally the homework would be now do it with these other 30 papers. I, I think absolutely. Um, it, it lowers one of the biggest barriers with statistics, which is to, to most people, it's just so abstract that you just cannot penetrate the concepts. For applications, I, I was more skeptical of it. So I, I would, for, for several years, I, I would warn PhD students against doing replications because it, it, it always has the human component where whoever fails, whoever's work fails to replicate. Um, the, now it's hate you and we will say negative things about you and may hurt your career but now there's been a few exercises where I, uh, the entire class like you were describing would be a replication there's but one that i think very exciting my my, my friend Leif nelson ran at berkeley where they they chose a topic uh in this case it was the, the impact of scarcity on multiple psychological phenomena and then in groups of two or three students each of them chose one published study in that literature and they they replicated it and then they turned this semester long replication effort into a PNAS paper. That's it's it's like a different type of meta-analysis because it's a meta-analysis of only replications. And one thing someone may have is that it, like actually I think you were hinting at that it may be demotivating for students, but in my experience, whether students succeed or fail, it, it just makes the research so real to them that it's actually quite motivating regardless of the outcome. So I become I was kind of skeptical to this kind of idea before but i've having seen the outcomes I, I'm, I'm i'm excited about it thanks vera yeah thank you um i i kind of agree it's part of the it's part of the research process so when when i teach no uh intro to stats or specification issues or the courses i teach in quantitative methods i always have uh, my students same thing uh replicate and one you know there are always two exercises i give them one paper with the data with the data that uh, goes with the paper and they have to do the replication analysis you know, with a set of guidelines at home, and then we discuss it. And then, you know, another, not an exercise, but the exam is that they um, go out there, choose their own empirical study, uh, get the data that uh, uh, goes with the study and replicate it and write a report on it. So I, I think it's a great idea because uh, students learn a lot and students also learn that, um, that you know, even, uh, Big names in the profession, right? Uh, uh, only what we, how we say in German, cook with water, right? So uh, that, that, uh, that they do analysis the same way as everybody else, and they are not uh, actually above making uh, any mistakes. And uh, so I think it's a good exercise also to see that um, that the research process is sometimes a bit messy. It's a bit. Uh, you know, can be riddled by uh, errors and mistakes, and uh, still in the end, we get results that make sense and are interpretable. So, yeah, I think replication helps a lot with understanding the research process. So I think it's a great way for students to learn about not just about statistics, but about research in general. Thanks. I first asked the quants and, and now I'm asking, asking the qual because, you know, replicating quant stuff is easier to, to teach than probably replicating qual stuff. So Sebastian, your opinion would be much yeah, appreciated. So, so we are actually very interested in that and there's various ways in which you can go about doing this. So one thing that that uh, Colin Elman, my, uh, my boss at QDR uh, and also Andrew Mirafchik do is they pick high quality 
uh, qualitative papers that have data that are obtainable. So public uh, documents, secondary sources, those sorts of things. And uh, essentially half students go through all the original sources um, and hunt them down and see if they, if, if the author's um, uh, claims are tenable. We, we like to call this verification. It's not reproducibility per se, but you kind of check, does it make sense? That's actually what we do for AJPS when they ask us to, uh, to do reproducibility checks uh, on a paper. And uh, that's a fair amount of work. I would like you need to you need to have a very good undergraduate class uh, with a fair amount of time to do that type of work. I think you should probably do it in a in if you have a dedicated uh, graduate qualitative method class. I think you probably should do this. Um, so so that's number one. The other thing is that. Uh, if you teach kind of more coding related qualitative uh, research that's more common outside of political science, but we see some of this in political science, you should absolutely have students uh, code and potentially even recode data that has been used uh, in articles and uh, instructors are doing this uh, not enough, I think, and we're pushing on both fronts. We're very interested uh, in that. Thanks a lot. Looking at the time, Lisa, I'm getting back to you maybe. Yeah, I see that unfortunately there is one more question, but yeah, I think we need to close just to, to be true with the time. Uh, it was an amazing panel and I think there's so many more questions that we would like to ask you, but it was also very inspiring at the same time to see and to also bring us another toast that we really should work on um, creating transparent results despite um, wherever in which field we are, whether we use qualitative or quantitative. Um, research, we should really live up to the standard. Uh, so thanks for motivating us to, to go this route. Um, thanks also to the audience and to the great questions. Uh, it was a very enjoyable uh, lunch break for us and hopefully Sebastian, for you a very enjoyable early morning. Thank you. Thank you.